30 to 50 percent of your fractures produce 80 percent of your hydrocarbons. That lends a lot of credibility. You know, if you come in and can be upfront and honest and say, you know, actually in this application, I think this product over here that I don't represent would be better for you. That all of a sudden now you become a trusted advisor rather than a salesman. And, you know, I often say that we have uh, all the requirements of space, right? Because it has to go underground and send us data from, from miles and miles away. And it has to work. Like, failure is not an option. Uh, we'll put on, you know, a standard meal shoe. Ours is slightly different just for that. But it's, you know, everybody's got one. The top drive and the drawers really don't care whether the electrons coming at it are from a joystick or a PLC. The, the panel, what you see here on the left, which is uh, now controlled by uh, one of my students, uh, is showing you actually uh, the control of our brake. As of now, geothermal is a pretty small, pretty small market. If you have torch velocity, the, uh, the casing will be up against the side on part of the well. There won't be any cement there. The cement will have crescent around it. So managed pressure drilling, it's been defined as a process to precisely control the pressure profile in the well bore. The key is being transparent with our clients in, in this case. So tell them what happened. If we had a failure, tell them exactly what happened. It, whether it's our fault, whether it's what, whatever the issue was, we need to be transparent. But I think it's very important for everyone in the industry to know what's out there and kind of what's happening down hole as well. I've probably worked on over 40 different performance limiters in my career. If I miss any of those and a computer is raising weight on bit and I miss any of those, I have a train wreck. The computer's going in the ocean. Here's your new colors, here's your new thing. Go and do that. Here's the all. tattoo you need to get. Yeah, here's the tattoo. Sorry about the last one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we used to fake that all the time. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the B Lock Miss Door. <laughs> I can't say it. V door locksmith. V door locksmith. All right. Yep, audio is working. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to the V door locksmith show. I'm your host, David Gibson, where we are unlocking the secrets to success in the oil and gas industry. One interview, one technical presentation, and one technical screw up at a time. And hopefully, hopefully, hopefully this week we don't have any major technical screw ups. But if we do, you know what? Just as we do here in the oil field, we'll get over it and we'll move on and keep going forward. Thank you guys all so much here for joining us. Please let me know where you guys are watching from. Um, really excited about today's show. Got an amazing guest on here today. Um, been an absolutely amazing week. Curious out there also if anybody, uh, hold on, I got to kick a couple of people from out behind the studio. Somebody, uh, they got the wrong link here. Kick from studio, kick guest. All right, anybody that's watching, please just watch over on LinkedIn or on YouTube. That's the place to be, not back scenes in StreamYard. All right, uh, this week we've got, uh, really excited about this weekend, there's F1 is in town. So if anybody is an F1 fan, let me know who you guys are cheering for. Um, I'm just cheering for a good race. Hopefully it'll be a lot of fun uh, and get to go out there and hang out with, and I have to say special thanks to uh, the team at Deep Energy Specialists, Kay Jackson. Um, oh my gosh, hold on. Uh, Ariel, I can see that you're watching from behind the scenes. This is for the live production part. Um, I'm going to kick you out one more time. This time just go over to YouTube and or LinkedIn to be able to watch the show. If you can't find it, uh, just Google, or not Google, but search on YouTube for Gibson Reports uh, or on LinkedIn, search for David Gibson. So there we go. Oh, he kicked himself out. All right, cool. Um, yeah, so there. It's hard to keep the show going straight uh, when you get random stuff packed around in the background. All right, guys, let me know what you guys are watching from. Blank screen here. What? Why do you have a blank screen? Uh, I will say this for anybody that is watching on LinkedIn. Uh, I noticed a couple of another streamer was having some di difficulties streaming their show um, earlier today. I um, uh, was watching uh, JP Warren's show and there was some, I don't know, it, it was glitching on the LinkedIn side. 
not on the YouTube side. So if you guys are having any issues, feel free to jump over to YouTube to be able to watch there if the stream is not coming through clearly on LinkedIn. So uh, here we go. John DeWart saying, tuning in. Good morning from Colorado, USA. Thank you for being here. Duncan, tuning in from H-Town. Uh, Derek Hudson uh, is just asking questions to John. Damon, uh, tune in. Good morning from Woodlands, Texas. Oscar, tune in from Columbia. Scott, Duhon, okay. Um, Tammy, I see that you just joined in back behind the scenes. If you would, please go over to LinkedIn or to YouTube to be able to watch the show, please. All right, kick from studio. There we go. All right, uh, Scott, thanks for being here. Jerry Hudson's back here. All right, uh, Beach, who's definitely somebody I need to get on the show. I'm going to send you another message today. Uh, Tracy, if you will remind me, she's not in the room. So I just looked over my computer screen to a blank chair. Forgot she's over in Kate's office. So, Peach, we need to get you on the show. Uh, thanks for being here. James, tune it in. Thank you for being here. Eric, tune in from South of France. Wow. Send us a picture. I'm curious what, what his view looks like. <gasps> oh, Jessica Patton, tune it in from Klavkov, New Mexico. Mm, when you're, you're, you're special, someone's on vacation and you're not. So. Thanks for tuning in, babe. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, Lee Bartholomew tuning in from Kingwood. Thanks for being here. Oh, so everybody's going to say, James is going to say hi to Peach. You say hi to us too, James. That's cool. Uh, Lisa tuning in from Dallas, Texas. Oh, Peach and everybody else having conversations. Dallas here uh, as well. Randy McFrancis tuning in from Katy, Texas. LinkedIn user from Humble, Texas. LinkedIn user is the biggest show fan. Everything looks good on YouTube. All right. Blank screen on LinkedIn. Uh, Neil Fletcher, tuning in from morning from Rival USA. I didn't know Rival was a city, but it is definitely uh, a great company. Thanks for you guys tuning in. Uh, no blank screen here. Working great. Well, thank you, Tracy, for letting us know. There's our Tracy. Uh, LinkedIn wasn't working. YouTube is good. Okay. This is, this is definitely strange. Uh, Thomas can tuning in from, uh, Oklahoma. All right. Then we've got Aaron, same issues here. Couldn't find video on LinkedIn. JP Warren, whose show I was watching earlier, who gave us a great lesson this morning that LinkedIn's being a little funny with the live streaming stuff. So thanks for being here, sir. Uh, Anderson tuning in from Brazil. Good gosh. Howdy from Dallas. James Franks. picture on YouTube blank screen on LinkedIn. Wow. Because I've actually got it pulled up on LinkedIn right here, and I'm able to see everything. So I really do not know what's going on. That's crazy. And tuning in from Calgary, thank you for being here. YouTube feed is significantly better. Well, thank you, Thomas. Yeah, uh, JP saying he had show issues with his show all morning. Yeah. Um, and Jessica's telling me, sure, on LinkedIn looks good. Well, there we go. All right. I got a special announcement today, um, mainly because the guest today uh, brought up this about um, everything that we had going on in the background here. He was talking about this. I don't know if anybody can spot the difference. It's like one of those little first grader things. Can you spot the difference in today's background? Um, if you can, let me know. Uh, but as we're getting this started, I need to pull this up. There we go. Be sure, because it's that time of the show, we're going to give away ourselves a drill bit. One of these fancy drill bits that changes colors. This is just in case anybody's curious and you're a 3D printing nerd fan like I am. This is Quantum PLA by Matter Hackers. I don't get paid by them. Uh, I get absolutely zero representation. Just wanted to let you guys know that's if you're if you're looking for it. It's Matter Hackers Quantum PLA that changes colors like that. So we're going to give away ourselves a drill bit if you will type in hashtag Corvo right now. Um, but the special announcement is. The next show that we go over 100 real-time viewers, I'm going to give away one of these guys. Just randomly thought of it. I'm going to give away, not this one. I will put your company's logo. Or if you don't work at a company, you're independent. We could just put your name on the back of it or whatever. We'll make one of these specifically for whoever um, whoever wins that day. The next time we go over 100 real-time viewers, right now we're at, I don't know, 50. So, but type in hashtag Corva. Uh, we've got an amazing partner with the show. And here is your Corva insight of the week. 
So when you think about supply chain in oil and gas, the first thing that comes to mind probably is the equipment, the resources, the people, and all the way from exploration to refining that end product, it takes all these different points to follow that life cycle. Now, software is really no different in the oil and gas industry. Getting data from sensors, bringing that to a database to the cloud, running those algorithms, having cloud providers, and ultimately ending up at a screen and a piece of software that users interact with, that requires different players at different stages all along the way. And the cool thing is we're really just at the beginning of it. Cloud hasn't been around for that long and it will continue to bring new players and new technologies that enter in this supply chain that are gonna make the analytics and the insights we get for our industry even that more powerful. All right, that was your Corva Insight of the Week. Thank you so much, Corva, for talking to us. All right, I had to stream. Why is that? Oh, I still got that thing up on there. I was like, why does that look like that brand? Take that one off, put that one back on. There we go. We've got 30 entries so far for this week. So if you want to get entered to be able to win the drill bit that we are giving away this week, now is your time that you've got to be able to put that in there. And let's see if we get any more in. I'll give it like a 10 second countdown. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We're still at 30. Oh, there we go. 31. All right. We'll hit. Oh, 32. Good gosh. All right. Ready? Here we go. And hit the drawing. So who is going to win this week? Now, if it's Tracy, because she commented earlier, I think she typed in hashtag. If it's her, then we're going to have to redo it. Oh, no, it's Damon. Damon, you are the lucky winner. New drill bit. There you go. We'll get one over those over to you, sir. Thank you so much for watching the show. I do appreciate it. All right, take that off. And now is the time that everybody is actually tuning in for. Um, just let everybody know if it's not working, head on over to YouTube. Let me actually, if Tracy, if you'll put the YouTube link into the comment section, um, we'll get that over for everybody. So here we go. Todd, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here, sir. Thanks, David. Hopefully you can hear me and, and see me just fine. Yeah, I, I I I can. I don't know if all the audience can. I know that we're having some issues with LinkedIn, obviously, here today. So hopefully uh, all of that gets uh, taken care of or something in the coming weeks, at, at least. All right. So for anybody that is watching that, if you guys do want to um, ask questions, I'll be honest. I've got like a whole list of questions and I know that. Uh, Todd and I several times have gotten into conversations before and ran into other meetings and stuff and really had to pry ourselves away from talking just to be able to go do other stuff that we're supposed to do. So if you want to be able to ask questions, I'm willing to concede the point and be able to let you guys get some in there. If not, I will totally take over today's show. So with that said, Todd, um, I know that your background is like you were doing stuff with Motorola. You were completely outside of the oil and gas industry. How did you get into the oil and gas business because it's you don't see very many people taking the same path that you did yeah i, I would say it's it's been a bit of a roller coaster and and certainly have sort of reinvented my career a couple times over the years but uh um for, for those of you that don't know, know me I, I i spent the first half of my career first uh i guess 12 15 years working for motorola doing signal processing on signal processing chips for everything from audio home theater to air brake controllers to uh, nav systems, all kinds of stuff at Motorola, it's semiconductor focused uh, for the first part of my career. And I, I got to a point to where I was managing overseas teams and seeing the chip business uh, outsource things overseas in a big way to the point to where I was concerned about, you know, getting to retirement age and having some job stability. So I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what industry would I want to go into. Uh, and strangely, at the same time frame, I kept seeing a, a person show up to my neighbor's house with these crazy sports cars and jacked up trucks and whatnot. And uh, really finally just said, well, what does this person do? This is kind of interesting. And it turned out they were a directional driller. Uh, they were in a directional drilling company. So that was kind of a, a really random sort of intro to something I had really had no connection to previously. And, and very stereotypical too. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's in hindsight, it's like, oh, well, obviously we're a directional driller. I can tell almost by the, by the type of tires and, and suspension system, what, you know, what, what they do, but, but uh um, so that was that was a intro to something I'd never even heard of before. And, and uh, initially, they were frankly they were a little bit cagey about it because you know most directional drillers don't want to share information about what they do. 
Um, but I, I mentioned I went to Colorado School of Mines, which is a school that's got a reputation in oil and gas. I honestly had zero intention of getting oil and gas when I was at, at School of Mines. But that got a connection to where they said, well, you know, you should talk to my brother who runs a company in Austin that does directional drilling. I thought, well, gee, you know, okay, that sounds like something industry to look into. Um, but it was really a desire to, to get away from an industry where I uh, you know, was very much enjoying what I was doing on the audio signal processing stuff. But I wanted to do something more electrical mechanical. And I wanted to do something that was more anchored to the U.S. market so they, it wouldn't necessarily, you know, find out when I was 60, 60 years old that I was outsourced. Um, and so I thought energy sector seemed like a good place to go. Uh, that turned into a, a, a whirlwind of working for a small startup directional company that had a lot of different brands of tools, different problems, st all your typical startup struggles and whatnot. And uh, being the only engineer at the company, all problems seemed to come to me as far as failures at 3 a.m. Uh, on a rig up in Wyoming or, you know, just virtually every problem I, I was I was I was uh, uh, put to my to my doorstep, if you will. And so. I learned by fire hose for a few years there. Um, and my expectation I set with the, with the owner of that company was that, you know, would eventually hopefully would design and build something that was interesting uh, in the oil field. And we developed a, a new kind of a downhole mud motor that was a smart motor, super high torque for North Dakota um, and got the attention of some operators. They ran them, it, it had successful runs. And, and uh, uh, that was, that was a, a really fun transition over just a few years that, that ultimately led to my connection with, with the people at Hunt, um, which led me to come back to work for, for, for Hunt as, as uh, that, that, that product was a success, but the startup itself uh, ultimately ran, ran into some financial troubles and ultimately couldn't move forward. But it, it gave me a way to get into the industry and get into working with Hunt where I, where I got involved in the uh, motive product that so many people might know me for. Okay, so take us through that, like take us through the beginning of like motive because obviously that was what i see as a as a game changer in the industry because i mean now there are you know multiple competitive products to that um and i don't think that that would have happened without some of the advances that motive had had actually made so like like take us through the beginning of that because i mean obviously i know that there had to be a, have been some pushback around the industry <laughs> well uh, pushback, it would be, I would say, would be an understatement. Um, <laughs> um, so, the, the 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 transition from the directional company where I had the mud motor, I, I I decided to to move on to something completely different. But I still wanted to work in the directional space, um, and I had been around a lot of directional drillers and MW hands uh, over the years uh, in, in that in that effort. And one of the things that struck me was that a large portion of those individuals had no uh, family life that was um, conducive to having kids and, and having a, you know, there, there's just a, frankly, there was a lot of divorce. There was a lot of uh, broken families. And it bothered me that a lot of people in their twenties and thirties, you know, were going out to these, these jobs for three or four, you know, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks at a time, not knowing they're going to come back and see the family. It really did, didn't work well for, for, for a, a cohesive family business. Um, on the same side, I also had a, a strong background in metalworking as one of my personal passions with uh, machine tools and metalworking. And I got to see that industry, not necessarily but during my you know, uh, recent lifetime, but, but over history of machine tools, go from people moving hand cranks and whatnot and, and trying to make repeatable products to CNC machines that would spit out the exact same product over and over again with, with high precision. And my first exposure to drilling rigs, uh, really, to me, it, it looked like a giant milling machine. And I thought, well, gee, why are people still pushing buttons and, and you know, running a brake handle um, when you know, so many other industries have gone to automation? So the combination of automation as a natural progression from other industries and uh, machine tools specifically, and the desire to figure out how to get people away from harm's way and, and uh, I'd say, a fairly dangerous environment, get more people away from that and give them a, a function that could be, um, they could go home and see their families at night. So, so there was, that was sort of the driving factors behind that. I mean, we, we've got people that have been in the motive program working in command centers that see their kids at night every day, every day that in, in their previous history, they may see them once a month. And that, that, that's really meaningful for me. Now, how to solve that problem. That was frankly, you know, there was, there were, hundreds of people that would say it's impossible. It's, it's, it's black art. It's, it's, you know, you can't, 
you can't automate this stuff. You got to be able to go out there and teach. I mean, there's people that say you can't even teach it. But I do oh, want to yeah. say, before we go any further, I do want to say, I think it's absolutely amazing to know that part of the genesis of this product was you trying to be able to give people a better life and, and get them home with their families, as opposed to what I know and I've heard these reactions before of trying to take somebody's job away. Yeah, so. I, that, that's, I, I used to call it, I felt like I was Darth Vader, because not only was I in the oil and gas sector, when you walk down the street and tell people your fossil fuels, they look at you like you kill puppies for a living. Um, but then the second part of it is, is that I was automating jobs, you know, and people thought, well, I'm trying to steal jobs or taking, you know, killing people's livelihoods. And the reality is that was not my motivation at all. I mean, there's, there's obviously there's commercial value to try to figure out how to optimize things in every way we can. But I really did not like the amount of, of uh, divorce and, and other things that I saw in the industry in my, when I was looking at it from the tools perspective. So, so that was my, one of my underlying intents and goals that I think very few people would recognize uh, in, in automation, but it's, it's been really, it's honestly, it's, it's been fulfilling for me to see people that work in our command center um, having kids and having, you know, you know, some of them, you know, during COVID were working from their houses and whatnot. So it's, it's really meaningful to see that. Um, but there were absolutely people that said, no way can you automate this. It's, it's secret sauce. It's art. You, you just can't do it. You, you, to your, to your point, David, that the people did not want to train other people how to do what they did because they felt like they were, they were devalue the uniqueness of their skill set. So we went through years of what was an apprenticeship taught business that the, the mentors had no desire to replace themselves or to de devalue themselves. And so I think automation in, in, inherently was needed to not only standardize and, and not ideally optimize, but just re remove the dependency on individual human styles and egos and stuff that, that made a big difference. Um, and uh, in, in the early days at Hunt, we, we looked at, you know, we had at that time, I think we had eight rigs running in South Texas. Every one of them was having different results in performance and accuracy and sidetracks and whatnot. And, and it turned out that the biggest variable was the human directional driller. And the concept was, well, how do we, you know, all these things kind of converge. Well, how can we automate that piece? Um, then the technology was, okay, sure, Todd, sounds like a great idea. Here's here's some seed funding to go make, you know, build this sort of company, if you will. Um, how do you solve that problem? How do you actually automate that? And so I chose, um, I, I'm giving a little, a little bit of personal history here of how this came about, if you will, but if, I don't know. No, I mean, today's show's about you, sir. Well, so so I chose to try to figure out how, what, what other industries can I learn from? And I, I'm a big believer, you know, I'm a crazy idea inventor type person, but I, your best uh, ideas and inventions are oftentimes repositioning something that was used in other industry. Or even probably even one step further, and is there something in nature that you can that you can adapt and, and learn from? I, I, I kind of use the, the example that years ago I was trying to make some electronics work in high vibration environments, and, and rather than trying to ask industry what they did, I went off and researched how woodpeckers don't get concussions. And it turns out they have they have a, a tongue that wraps around their brain that acts as a suspension system. So. Um, that's just a side note, but there are, there are things we can retrospectively look at other industries or our nature and find out what, you know, what has, you know, well, what has God done to, to, to solve problems or what have we evolved into to solve problems? Um, and uh, I found that to be a, a good source of inspiration. In this case for, for directional drilling, um, I searched out people that had experience in guiding uh, torpedoes. Um, because as I saw it, the three-dimensional math problem of trying to acquire a Russian submarine with a torpedo shot from a, a submarine was dealing with currents and water that would push the torpedo one direction or another, which I would, I would say the analogy is, is rock formation, rotary build and walk tendencies. You had the optimal path and it was really darn important to get the optimal path because if you didn't, then you'd miss them and they'd shoot and blow you up sort of thing. So it just it resonated with me as, as a horizontal... Uh, three-dimensional math problem-solving guidance system that was really relevant. So I thought, well, gee, where, how the hell do I find where GPS doesn't help? work? Yeah, G GPS doesn't work. Low data rates. I mean, there, there's there's a lot of parallels there. Now, we, we used we didn't just use one industry, but that was that was the one that kind of stuck out as being probably the most interesting um, uh, because you know things like tool face is a really hard thing to articulate in three-dimensional math. It's it's actually more complicated than, than, than initially 
it, it seems when you try to solve some of these problems. Um, as simple as it seems in retrospect, being in this world all the time. Um, but the I, I found some some military researchers and and actually based in Austin in a military research lab there and, and found a way to uh, sign a contract where they could do some consulting work outside of the military industry space. And we actually had torpedo physicists working on our team early on, and uh, that helped wow. with some of the basic three dimensional math problems. Um, but really, probably the, the the probably the I don't say the epiphany moment, but one of the things that really kind of triggered things in a positive direction was how do you prioritize what are almost infinite options to go forward and do? And what I mean by that is if, if you look at Google Maps and I, I try to give directions to a restaurant, you know, it, 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 it considers lots of different options. Um, and some of those options may be faster, slower, traffic and whatnot. And, and I think, well, what, what are the parallels we can do to Google Maps uh, in our space? Well, um, we thought, well, gee, what's important? Well, you have tortuosity is important for a number of reasons you've talked on some of your previous shows about. Um, proximity to pay zone. I mean, there, there are people that think you're gonna frack it no matter where it is, but in truth, there are some benefits to being as close to targets possible, or at least at the very least away from, from the perils of, of an ash bed or something if you get you stuck. Um, so proximity to target or proximity to pay zone is, is an important piece. And then time. I mean, it, it, it's it's still it's still kind of, uh, kind of interesting that, that on the onshore market, our drilling time is something in the 50 cents to a dollar a second. So if you think about that context, like in my head, I think of a little spinning meter on a gas pump just spinning like crazy as far as what the cost of Time is, is quite valuable in our space. It's even worse than offshore. Um, so the challenge we had is we had almost infinite mathematical solutions for the torpedo to hit the target or for the drill bit to get to, to stay in zone. Um, and we had to figure out how to prioritize the best solution. Uh, every time we had a survey, every time we had a new piece of information. Um, and uh, we ultimately took torch velocity, proximity pay zone, and uh, time and put those in a common denominator of dollars. So it's, it's called drilling by dollars. And so it was you know, relatively easy for us to convert time. You know, if, if we knew the RLP in recent history, knew where we we're going, we could backtrack that and figure over the next several hundred feet, it's going to take us this much time, which was equated to dollars. Um, with proximity to pay zone, we used like an accountant's perspective and say, what's the net present value per foot of the well if I'm on target, if I'm away from target? Um, and so that was a value we could apply to every foot of the projected what we're going to do in the future. And the last one was tortuosity, which was a little softer, but we had you know, enough data from industry about casing, you know, wear or, or sucker rod issues or pump failures that we could put a dollar amount on that. A little bit looser, but it was something you could stack in. And then you just kind of sort you know, there's some machine learning and whatnot there, but you, you sort this by what is the most optimal, you know, financial benefit today on what to do forward. And that's what we drove our, our turn by turn navigation, which became motive. But wow. it's a little bit of a long winded explanation, but it's, it's we, we, we leverage other industry knowledge. We, we in, it recruited people that were software developers in those industries or other industries that were parallels. Um, we, we, we lived and did coding work on rigs. Uh, one of the beauties of being a software team, team in a an operator is that we had full access to all the data and all the rig sites and whatnot. We literally, for months, live you know, you know, three or four weeks at a time, would be out there in this little shack with bunk beds with the core developers developing solutions for the for the rig, and that was magical as far as not only not only for for making progress and seeing it firsthand, but getting a, a sense of the domain for people that had didn't have that background. Not, not a single software developer that came on the team, at least for the early stages, had ever seen a rig floor. Um, and, that, and that's that's something that to, the, sort of that immersion into the into the, the, the target application space was critical. Um, so that's you know that was another thing that was a major impact to getting us going in the right direction. But after that, it became uh, frankly a it was a major step to let somebody take control of the well. Not, not this was an automation. This was turn by turn, but let a, yeah. an iPad on a rig floor tell them what to do, when, when to slide, what target tool face, when to rotate. That was really a major step. Um, that was, gosh, that was back in 2013, 14, something that ballpark. 13, I guess. Actually, maybe 12. Actually, 12 was probably the first one. I remember being totally puckered up on the rig floor. And, and of course, when you're drilling, things don't go that fast. I mean, you're, at that time we were drilling, you know, rota rotating at 50 or 60 foot an hour, which wasn't fast by today's standards and sliding yeah. at like 10 foot an hour. <laughs> it's slow by today's standards, granted, but it was still, 
it was a uh, highly anxious, couldn't wait to see what the results were going to be when, when we, we let, let go of decision making, let the computer tell us what to do. So how was the um, the adoption and like the initial like when y'all went outside of Hunt for the first time to be able to start showing this to other companies? How was that initial uh, meeting and feedback? You know, it it was. It's funny because the, the the adoption of technology is directly correlated to the market. If the market's growing or shrinking, um, you you would think that when a market's shrinking, um, you would be more apt to pick up technology, try to lower costs. But it's actually people become more risk averse. So we, we, when we first went to the outside customer base, it was in a growing market where people were having a hard time finding qualified directional drillers. And they were and DDs were making mistakes that were measured in, in millions of dollars regularly. So the first couple of customers we talked to were incredibly excited to have something to standardize on that from the office perspective. Um, and uh, we, we picked up two customers right away that were ready to scale as fast as possible. They couldn't wait to get, get it going. Um, and naively, I mean, I, I, I'll step back and say, I, you know, a lot of this challenge over the years, I, I, I thought was a technology challenge and actually it was a psychology challenge. Um, naively, I didn't realize, or I didn't fully comprehend that the office people, the drilling engineers and management being excited about technology and the people on the rigs adopting and using the technology were two completely different things. And it was very common that a drilling engineer would say, oh, this is, this is awesome. I would tell my guys to use this and we'd say, okay, so, so you're going to give instructions to, they're, they're going to follow this stuff. Oh yeah. I, I, you know, I manage the rig. I'll, I'll tell them what to do. They'll do it. And we get up to the rig and they're like, well, what are you doing here? Why are you here? Um, <laughs> you, I, I'm responsible for this. Well, I'm not going to let some iPad tell me what to do. And, and the, the software was not running on an iPad. It was far more complex than that. We had big servers running the software downstairs and the, the iPad was just a user device, but, but there was a perception of like, no way I'm not going to let some, some app from a, you know, from, from the, the, you know, the Apple store tell me how to drill a well and, and you can't, it can't possibly work. And so we had built some huge credibility inside the hunt organization in part because it was one vertically integrated group of people and we did have significant leverage, but when we went outside, there was a distinct recognition that the, the office and the field were not on the same page particularly with anything that related to automation or anything that related to uh, things that were perceived as taking away jobs or taking away value of what they, they were delivering in the field. So we, we did almost, I don't know a nice way to say it, but it almost felt like marriage counseling at one point in time. We were trying to figure out how to get the office and the field to be on the same page. And that, this varied dramatically from company to company, but it was oftentimes that, that uh, we got in the middle of something that that we were just trying to help drill the well and, and it became a control between uh, field and office that was a, a major overcoming. This is beyond just the you're taking my job sort of sort of pushback. This was the who's in control of the actual steering of the well kind of kind of thing that we got stuck in the middle of. I can just imagine like all of the 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 phone calls and like not trying to step on people's toes and, and like, like I'm not trying to do this, but we kind of need to do this and coaxing egos and everything else. Cause, um, 2013, 2014 was definitely one of those time periods where the, um, best way to say it is the superiority complex of DDs was at a all time high. I think their pay was at an also at an all time high, uh, then as well. So that, you know, just completely added to, uh, the situation, but I think it's a great, um, story for, for other entrepreneurs to be able to take into consideration if you are creating a product and then you go and sell it to the operator and you don't have that field level buy-in, yeah. there are going to be bumps in the road oh, as, it's, as that goes along. Yeah. I mean, if for anyone in the audience that's doing a startup, whether it be a hardware tool or a software tool or anything of that nature, uh, don't underestimate change management. Um, change management is something that, that uh, it's not unique to oil and gas by any sense. If you, if you go back in time, I mean, robotic welding, you know, automotive production lines using robots, anything that's, that involves automation, there's a significant change. I mean, whether it's Uber versus taxi drivers. I mean, there's, there are myriads of examples of things that are just very challenging, uh, resistant to change. 
Um, there are also things that are success stories too. So, so there's usually some kind of event or some kind of a major um, inflection point in, in industries where things flip over and then everything goes 100% in that direction. I mean, I think it's, if you look at taxi versus Uber, um, I mean, Uber has won that battle in almost every city of, that I've been involved with or been to recently. But there was a time where it was it was really an uphill struggle for the Uber drivers to get out there, and taxi drivers were slashing tires. It was all kinds of crazy stuff. We we had you know frankly we experienced some some sabotage where people tried to to uh, cause the algorithm to do something differently by giving it false information. We we, we had a whole series of stuff. Uh, we actually had to build a system oh gosh. called a, a judge report that would track the the, the actual actions and and what was given to the system. So we'd have basically a, a black box after the fact that we could show if something if something went unusual, we could show how it happened. So so it, it's unfortunate we had to have that. Now the fact that we had a thing called a judge report just put further psychological disconnect between us and the DDs we were trying to work with because they oh yeah you're judging me now. So, so, so every, every, almost everything, we, we made all kinds of mistakes. I'll tell you that. So, so, um, but I would, I would, the, the piece of advice I could give to anyone that's trying to do something disruptive in the industry or any industry for that matter, don't under, may, underestimate the people that you're changing and the, and the dialogue you have with them and how you, how you convince them or, or, not, or, you know, work with them through that change. I think today things have got far enough along to where people recognize, at least I hope this is the case. That, that automation and optimization stuff like this can actually be an opportunity for them to improve their career and their, and their personal you know, uh, uh, work-life balance, if you will. Um, people that see the path to having kids and whatnot because of this is, is just awesome to see people that are, that are having, you know, the, the, better, the ones that are actually are good at what they do, directional drilling, can actually have impact on five rigs, six rigs, eight rigs, and go home at night. I mean, that, to me, that's, that's, that's a success story. But that wasn't obvious along the way. We, we, we hired a lot of directional drillers to be part of the algorithm development um, to figure out how to make their lives better. We had people that we hired directional drillers to go out and train other DDs to run the software and try to help uh, get them over the, over the hump of using it versus resisting it. Um, but it, it was frustrating for, for probably for everybody, frankly, uh, on how to, how to make that transition happen. What was one of the big things that you learned from change management and when did you like, when did you clue in that you were like, all right, this is something that I need to like dive deep into studying to be able to help um, get the, you know, get this product moved forward. You know, it, it, I can't point to a specific time because we, we'd have success stories and then we'd have a failure and it, we'd, we'd lose traction and, and the failure, I, I, I can only think of one or two things that were actually like software bugs or, or system things that were true failures. It was almost always um, miscommunication or, 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 or something that was related, related to resistance, resistance to change. Um, but it's, it was a, a humbling experience to see things that were totally out of your control, particularly you know, if you're in the chair of, of a startup CEO and your future, um, uh, the future of your team that you've built that work for you, it feels like a family at a startup, are totally um, are totally dependent on that that success happening, and it feels like it's out of your control. It's a very frustrating situation to be in. So, I spent a lot of time learning, learning, looking at other industries, just like I said, the technical side, but for for the psychology side of things. And you know, I looked at Uber. Uber, you know, those people don't remember this, but they they went off and they contracted with. Um, uh, you know, limousine and, and uh, town car drivers to deploy it initially. And they did that because the, the users, I, I, I researched this and talked to actually Uber employees and whatnot, that when you first got your first Uber back in 2011, 10, depending on what city you're in, um, the driver was excited about this. And they conveyed that this was a wonderful thing and they gave great service. They, they, they were not only were they knowledgeable about driving and customer service and all those sort of things, but they were going through like, well, gee, today I get like one or two airport pickups a day and that, 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 that pays the bills, hopefully. And Uber comes along and suddenly they had 15 drop, you know, pickups and drop-offs in a day. They were making way more money. And so they were super excited about it. So as it deployed, Uber didn't try to deploy it with taxi drivers. They tried to do it with, with another you know, low volume, high margin, high, high customer service component. Um, and then 
as you got used to using Uber and they started putting in Uber XL and Uber X, well, that really upset the, 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 the drivers that were the town car drivers. And they generally would, would, would start talking negatively or, or start giving bad feedback about, about Uber. But by that time, everybody had, had gotten used to the experience and they didn't blame the Uber app, they blamed the driver in most cases, if they had a bad experience. So mm -hmm. it's all about having that first experience be positive and then, you know, future things, you jump to the conclusion that there must be the individual operating or the person in the seat as opposed to the technology itself. That was, was one thing I learned from Uber, but it was hard, frankly, it was really hard to convey. The way I tried to convey it was to deploy with partner directional companies. And we set up a, a preferred directional company partners with the idea of, well, if we get the directional company on board and they have a revenue stream from this, they will look at this as a way to deploy and it helps their margins, helps their business and differentiates them. And that seemed to make perfect sense and align to this town car business model. Unfortunately, the individual directional drillers, even for those companies, were still mercenaries. They were still yeah. at the day rate, and if, and if they could <clears throat> they get paid someplace else, they would gladly jump to a different company. So even though it might be the best thing for that directional company, and we were aligned again with the management there, it wasn't necessarily aligned um, with the individual where the rubber hits the road. And they were the one that, that sort of told the story on rig site to the company man and others about what happened, what was the problem, what were the challenges. And they could, they could undermine us extremely fast in ways that were not fair, but they were, they were just, it was natural human instinct to resist. So, so although I tried to apply things from, from Uber, it, it, it didn't really uh, work out as well as I'd hoped it would be, or hoped, hoped it would. Uh, the other thing that I think I saw Thomas Cannon put a comment about a champion of the field, I a hundred percent, I believe that's that's an accurate portrayal that's 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 you must have a champion for the change but yeah in the field uh, yeah and, and if, if i was to divide up the companies whether it be motive or any other technology deployment that i've ex had experience with um uh that has been the difference if you have somebody who has respect in the field and i won't name customers but but we've had a couple of really good successful partners out there that are big name companies, but it came down to, it, it wasn't the name of the company that made the difference. It was the name of the, of the individual that was the influencer in the field that, that was, had bought into change uh, and bought into this as being, want to be part of the, you know, uh, probably the, 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 I want to be on the bus as opposed to get run over by the bus is one of the phrases I heard uh, over, over time. <laughs> and uh, once you get a couple of those individuals and they start having success, it, 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 it grows organically. Um, but trying to find that champion in each individual customer is very, very difficult. And what's what's happening now um, that I wish I would have the benefit of back in back you know ten years ago is now there's a trend towards these things that people are have kind of concluded it's got to go this direction, get on board, and those champions are getting more prevalent. Uh, in part because I guess in some cases we've had we've had some retirements of people that wanted to do it the old way, and and we have a lot you know. Newer people joining the industry, they're more technology uh, familiar or comfortable. Um, but it's, I think, organizations are moving towards optimization, factory drilling, more and more, and, then, and automation is just a natural progression towards that. Not sure if I answered yeah. your question, David, or not. I, I sort of rambled. No, no I, I mean, all of this is is absolutely great information and great stuff to be able to hear, and you know, tons of lessons to be to be learned through you know, your experiences and, and, you know, what you went through. I mean, there's been, you know, similar things that I have done with other business ventures to where, you know, you get out there to the field and, you know, it's, you know, one directional driller and one MWD hand, if they don't want the technology to work, they can make sure that it doesn't work. So if you don't have the buy-in of, of them, the company man, the drilling engineer, um, and so, and it doesn't even have to be new technology, you know, if it's the, CEO that steps in and says, this directional company is going to be the company you use, right? Yeah. Trust me, the first boo-boo that you make, you're out of there, you know, because yeah. that's just the way that it's going to be. But that's, it's, it's really good cool. to be able to hear the, 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 how you kind of approached it. I, I think, it, I think things have gotten better, but it, it's very difficult when the, the person who's historically responsible for the function that you're automating is the person that people look to to say, does it work or not? It's it's like installing Uber on a taxi and then asking the taxi driver, does he think, does he think it works? Well, the taxi driver does, has no motivation to, to see it work. And, and 
even if they have an open mind, they still want to believe inherently that they're better at it. Um, it may be good for those other guys, but for me, you don't need it because I, I, I have the, the knowledge or the best experience. And so um, I, I use a lot of analogies. That's, that's kind of my thing. But, but uh, you know, you, you can, if, if you can guarantee you had the best, best human taxi driver in New York City every time, there'd be a debate about, you know, how, what's the appropriate level of automation and whatnot. But um, truth of the matter is you, you get random taxi drivers that, that have varying competencies and, and, and having a standardization using whether it be Google Maps or whether it be Uber, it's an enhancement. And then furthermore, if you take somebody who's an expert taxi driver in New York, but do it their whole life and drop them to LA, how good are they there? And that's the other thing that, that, that using data and data mining and, and things like that over regions, um, somebody who is an expert, you know, driller in the Piance or, or North Dakota, and then they go out to West Texas or, or, South Texas, they may have to relearn everything all over again, and so, so those sort of those sort of digital systems are really um, help us with scale and consistency in ways that that you know, other than cloning the best of the best, I, I don't see how you how else you get there. It's great you say uh, you know cloning consistency because that has been Matt Isbell's uh, presentation, Matt from uh, Hess, and every one of his talks that went out there was you know they were just in the initial phase of what they were doing at Hess, it wasn't about drilling faster. It was just about drilling more consistently across all the rigs that they had. And, you know, they had, you know, he, there's a famous candlestick plot that he had where it's like, you know, 2013 all the way down to, you know, wherever, at whatever point in time that you get to see the presentation, 2020, 2021, I think is when I saw it, or 2019. You know, and everything just got more and more and more consistent. And then gradually, at the same time, they were getting better performance. But the the consistency was the thing that they were most clued in on. So yeah, that, so, so, you know, especially with manufacturing drilling. You know, yeah. So, so the the, the challenge, and, and and you know, as we progressed the motive product, and it spun out as a start, a step, you know, standards, a startup company with GE Ventures funding and other people. As an individual company, that made it easier for us to work with third-party operators outside of Hunt. And then we got acquired by Helmer Campaign that, that was a huge boost to making things fully automated because they had a standardized fleet with control systems that were advanced. And that and that that was that was a huge, huge boost to say the least. Um, but it, that standardization, you have to have some kind of automation. And if you talk to most operators in the in the, the drilling manager office and above. They want repeatability, predictability, so they can so they can schedule frac fleets and production and plan stuff. That's incredibly important to them. But when you go to a rig site, all you see is plaques on the wall of fastest lateral, fastest curve, fastest you know one bit runs and whatnot. And so speed tends to be at the field level tends to be um, acknowledged and rewarded and and uh, prioritized at times over consistency. And so I, I, if you get a chance, uh, one, of my, one of my favorite analogies for that speed versus accuracy or speed versus consistency sort of thing is, is uh, really not such a great, that's a great movie called Days of Thunder with uh, Tom Cruise and, and whatnot. And there's, a, there's a scene in there called uh, Tires Win Races. If you just do a, a Google YouTube video, it'll, it'll be like a two minute video, it's Tires Win Races and kind of almost categorizes a, a directional driller trying to, to, to Put too much weight on bed or too much high different pressure and going crazy trying to optimize for speed versus somebody who's more consistent and repeatable and whatnot and uh anyway so was, i would encourage you to, to just do tires win races and watch a little two-minute video and it's such a, a good parallel to how consistency actually out outpaces and wins over over brute force and and rop as a, as an only priority people typically have so yeah, maybe here in the future, instead of people posting on LinkedIn uh, record wells, they'll say most consistent uh, wells on a pad. You know, all of oh, them finish if, with if, a plus or minus five minutes of each other or something. Yeah, I think if there's some kind of standard deviation sort of charting or something like that, that would be you know, it's like playing playing horseshoes as opposed to trying to shoot horseshoes. I, I don't know if that, that's a bad analogy, but but trying to stay as consistent as possible is, is has significant value there. Somebody is still having problems with our LinkedIn feed. So yeah, if you guys are watching on LinkedIn and you're having any issues or whatever, just jump over to uh, YouTube. It seems to be working a little bit better there. There are some that are working on, on LinkedIn and it's fine, but if you need to jump over to 
uh, YouTube. All right. And if anybody else has any questions, feel free to be able to throw them out there. Love to be able to get your questions uh, over to Todd. Todd, tell me about like, what do you think? And I know there's certain things you can and can't say, but what do you think about the future of directional drilling and automation? Where are we headed with this? Like, are there still layers to this onion that we can, you know, peel back? Is there still more or, is, or are we pretty close to um, the, some of the final steps, I guess you could say? Yeah, well, there's there's a, a lot of stuff. Uh, I, there's a lot of stuff I can't talk about in specifics, but but in general, so just to be clear, today I'm I'm the chief innovation officer at, at Hunt Energy, and I'm working on things across a lot of different platforms, everything from um, uh, utility grades, uh, storage to refineries to LNG plants and whatnot. But I still hold a role in the in the research development team as a technical fellow at HP, and so. There's a lot of collaboration going on there. I, I still get to, to be involved in, in some of that future development. The, the cutting edge stuff, I, I can't I can't speak to. I, I, this this morning, as an example, I'm, I was having a really exciting call with Angus Jamison, who was on your your show in the past. He and I get together and have like a crazy ideas call every so often. That's that's a lot of fun. Um, but I can't share. Oh, it's to be a fly on the wall for that. Yeah, it's a it's a fun call. But uh, what I what I can share is stuff that's happened in the past that kind of leads up to this. Uh, so. After the acquisition of HP, automation of the rig with, with directional drilling was a, was a no-brainer, but we wanted to build up some other pieces of technology that, that built out the portfolio for what we call the, you know, the Thomas Drilling Platform. Uh, it's been renamed a, a few of things, I think, since then. But we were trying to figure out how do we, how do we digitize the entire process? And so not long after Motive, I, I worked with John, the CEO there, to acquire Magvar. So Magvar was a company that does survey correction. It allowed us to 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 make better decisions with the automation platform, but have better sense of where we were at at every point in time, using the Magvor platform and have those things connected to each other in the way they function uh, at a real time basis. Then we we hired we uh, acquired Angus Jamison Consultant to further uh, get into some some I guess I'll, I'll say newer technology related to automation using some of his skill sets. And that team in, in Inverness is just an amazing team. You've you've talked to Angus a couple of times. He's a, he's, a, he's a unique individual as far as technology, uh, history, and whatnot. Um, but then we extended into a drill scan. Drill scan uh, with uh, Stefan and his team uh, were just incredible mathematicians and doing the physics of drill string torque and, uh, torque and drag and stick slips and, and all this. That gave us a whole other dimension to add to the automation platform, particularly when you're talking about rig control systems to optimize oscillation and whatnot. That was a huge uh, piece of it. We also gained some some well planning bit bit performance evaluation stuff in the process. That was layering on, and and then you know one of the more recent ones that we we did was we acquired a, a lot of technology and computer vision uh, from a company called Kovar, uh, and those pieces are are starting to show up in the field now uh, on some rigs that are doing safety related things, watching for people to stay out of harm's way. But ultimately, there's a lot of applications, a lot of IP in the space of how do we use computer vision to track track pipe and things like that on the, on the rig floor. Um, all those people, all those pieces come together in a digital platform coupled with the automation stuff that HP has built over the years for mechanization, automation, whatnot. All these things ultimately come together in something that is, is I think it's gonna be really magical in the future. Um, I, I can't, I, I, I shouldn't talk much more about it beyond that, but it's uh, for the customers that are working with that team uh, with HP on some of that platform, it, it's, I think there's, you can start to really see um, out the window what the future really is going to be. So what would be your advice to any, um, I mean, young or old uh, entrepreneur who maybe has an idea that they want to be able to implement into um, not just, you know, oil field services um, or the oil industry, but just in general? Well, that's a, that's a tough question. Um, so uh, I've had a lot of crazy ideas that that had no practical way to get to commercializations, uh, at least on my own personally. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of vendors out there that have uh, scars and failures and whatnot uh, that they could share. But um, you have to have not just you know, for, first off, money is an important thing. So so the whole experience of raising money from venture capitalists and whatnot is one piece I could talk for a couple hours on by itself. Um, you have to have a commercial access point. So, you know, if if I had the best, 
I'm going to just make up a fictitious example. If I had the best toaster oven in the world that just it made the best grilled cheese you'd ever imagined, <laughs> you know, getting that out to market is really hard. Um, and infom infomercials are real expensive. Getting shelf space at Walmart is almost impossible without paying for it. I mean, it's it's really hard. And nobody's going to want to see Todd Benson show up with a toaster oven at their front door. So, so finding a path towards commercialization is important. Um, finding a path towards technical realization is also important. So if we use the, the example of motive and ultimately the auto slide algorithms that can direct control the rig and whatnot, um, if I was not developing that inside of, of Hunt, there's no way it would have got, gone anywhere um, because we had we had ultimate control and ownership of the wells and whatnot. Any risk that we were taking, they, they were willing to take because they had an upside from it. Um, but even being part of an operator, there was no rig contract that let us plug into their $30 million asset and just you know plug a serial cable in and say, oh, we'll take control from here. They're not, they're never going to do that for safety reasons, for commercial reasons and whatnot. So, uh, and part of the journey being acquired by a rig contract, it was a natural progression to allow us to go from turn by turn navigation to full, full automation that would never have happened as a third party. So, so, and, and both. cut out are you here Todd? i'm still here i think uh, oh okay Sorry, just like the last little bit uh glitched for a second okay let me so so being inside a hunt as a commercial deployment was a huge advantage being inside hmp was absolutely imperative for us to have to go to full automation and then to be able to actually have uh frankly the credibility of, of a company like hmp to go talk to customers about the future of things and have customers that would want to try it out they're more apt to try it with a credible partner that is there and, and has skin the game than, than you know some Silicon Valley startup company that says, hey, I, I got this new widget. So so I'm, I'm not answering your question directly, but I'm saying that, that to, to, to take an invention or an idea to a full product that actually has impact on society or, or industry, it's more than just a good idea in dollars. You have to find a way to get your path in a way that can actually be implemented. Now, if you're making beanie babies and you can sell them at the at the flea market, yeah, make them in your garage and you can bootstrap it up and whatnot. But something of the nature of this, the uh, you know, drilling automation or most drilling technologies in general, you have to have uh, a partner. You have to be positioned in a place that actually can implement it safely. Um, and uh, um, it's just it's 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 a challenge and it's it's more than just the technology. I guess if I, if there was anything on that, I'd say that going from technology to psychology to commercialization. You can't just choose one and, and be excellent at one piece. You have to be able to 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 spend the breadth of all those different challenges. And um, James Frank says, "I'd buy a Todd Benson toaster oven any day." <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to know that I'm not working on toaster ovens these days. Uh, I'm, I'm working on some other crazy technologies. I can't I can't talk about in great detail today, unfortunately, but maybe in a future time. And, and a lot of what I'm working on is, is outside the drilling scope. So maybe it's not appropriate for the Vidor Locksmith show anyway, but it, uh, I mean, a lot of different transitions. Is it good? I said anything's appropriate for this show. Well, then tell us, like, I know you said you could talk about this for hours. Just give us, like, some quick highlight points for raising money with, with VC or, or being able to do funding uh, at, at, a, at a startup stage. You know, it, it's it's interesting that there's, there's a – chicken and egg scenario. Um, everybody in venture wants to see a proven startup CEO. Um, and it's kind of funny because, you know, you've got wildly successful startup CEOs that make enough money off their first startup and they're set for life and they're done. And then you have people that, 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 that failed miserably and sometimes they're the most prepared to, to go at it again. Uh, and then you have people that this is their first company they've ever run or they founded and whatnot. And uh, it's, it's a challenge to be a true founder of a company that becomes the CEO, which is, I, there's some high percentages about the founders being CEOs being highly successful, but almost every founder is lacking in some piece of what's needed for the venture capital to check the boxes, whether they, they don't have enough business experience, technical experience, they don't have the right, you know, it, there's, there's all series of things they're looking for to check the boxes. Um, but I, I found that, that going to venture to get venture is, I think it's 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 a tough uphill battle where you actually have your best success is if you have something that's already bootstrapped and moving that the venture start people start coming to you 
and you start getting introduced at, at uh, you know, you, you get introduced at a, at a conference or a paper or something that, that people people in the industry recognize what you're doing is different enough to where it gets, you get some, you know, it gets a PR out of it, if you will. And the venture people will find you. Um, and at that point, then, then it's, it's a much easier, easier transaction to have, but you also have to determine if the, what you're doing is aligned with what the venture goal people's goals are. Um, there are some ventures that, that, uh, um, expect an immediate return on investment. Um, there's some that are in there for the long haul. There's some that are energy knowledgeable. Um, there are some venture capital organizations inside of operators that would, would uh, reference themselves as being a strategic investor and that if you get that investment, it helps you get business with that company. I've actually ironically found that that's more often than not not the case. Um, that sometimes the, the, the operators, the, the operations people will treat things that come from their internal venture department with more scrutiny than an outside company at times. It's, it's, it's kind of an ironic thing. <laughs> it wouldn't happen, but it, it, I've seen at least two or three examples where it does. Um, but uh, um, you, have to, you have to be able to convey the numbers. You have to be able to convey the value proposition. You need to have a strong uh, IP portfolio in these days that, that gives you a moat around your castle, if you will. Um, and you know, you have to show that not, it's not just an idea, but it's a team that could actually execute that idea. So the, 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 you know, I, I'm not saying that I'm a big believer in having a, a, um, a series of resumes that, that, that look really fancy from certain universities and whatnot, that's going to make your funding happen, but you need to have a credible team of management that are, are passionate about what, passionate about what they're doing. And they have the skills and the experience that people look at and say, "Oh, I believe they're going to make that happen." I mean, even even today, uh, I've I've I was involved in a lot of M and A activity at 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 H and P. I'm, I'm involved in some potential investments in companies and startups and stuff and partnerships and stuff at, at at Hunt. Today, I look probably equally at the team that we're investing in as I do the technology. Because you can almost guarantee anything that's truly disruptive is going to it's going to fail and have to be figured out how to rebuild and go back again into the fight. Um, and if you have the right team, they will immediately focus on fixing the problem as opposed to whose fault is it. If you have a bad team, you get finger pointing and all kinds of destructive things, and it just isn't a fun place to work. So I found in in our experience with with uh, the Motive platform, which has had many names over the years, that we failed a lot of times in ways that, that you know, fortunately weren't necessarily failures that they were catastrophic by any sense, but, but we had to adjust and adapt and pivot on, on things we were doing. And the team always maintained um, uh, a positive attitude and how to move forward on things. And so as I look at which companies are going to be successful, it's, it's as much, it's, it's much about the, 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 the work ethic or the, the adaptability or the creativity of the people that we're talking to. And, and of course, ethics and the, go above all those things. But, but uh, it's as much about the people as it is about the technology. So a, a good idea without a team to make it happen is just a good idea. And so I, I've, I frankly, have, I've been blessed to be able to hire people and bring people on to the teams I've been part of that are just incredible individuals. And, uh, um, you know, that, that, there are a lot of times that some of the some of the things that we've done get attributed to, to one or two people, but it's 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 not. It's, I mean, I'll be I'll just throw one out there. Like if you look at the motive platform and whatnot, I, I had a lot to do with some of the concepts and how to design it, and build it. What I have I didn't write a single line of code, and 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 I that I'm a completely competent software you know, person from my early part of my career. I, I used to write DSP code all the time, but in that project, I, I found really smart people that that I got to focus on the interaction with customers and the practical challenges and problems and figure out how to conceptually on a market board, draw something up. And I had a team of brilliant people that could turn that into algorithms that, that would be functional. So it's, I'm, I'm rambling here, David, sorry, but it's, it's, no, no, this is team, all good. This is all the team, good. The team is really critical. And I think a lot of people, people, you know, particularly early stage inventors will go in and they'll, they'll jump to go try to find um, venture funding for something. And it's just, it's just them and they think they can do everything. And uh, I think having that strategy, and I'm not saying it has to be the pedigree of, of a Harvard PhD, you know, MBA and, and MIT PhDs, it doesn't have to be that at all. But you just, you just have to have a group of people that, that, can, that can 
adapt and, and be creative and, and get, get along together, frankly, because you're, I can, I can tell you if I didn't get along with the software developers early on the project, we, we lived in a, a, uh, a trailer that was the size of my office now, which isn't that huge. It's, it's pretty small. Uh, not that my office is fine, but it just, it's, the trailer is not big is my point. And we had you know, yeah. a bathroom, three bunk beds and a bunch of desks. And, and I mean, and we were, we were living off of uh, free, you know, let's see, it's a wavy lays and, and, uh, Little tangerines and uh, double stuff Oreos was like the, the typical HEB on the way to the rig sort of pack of of, of, of uh, junk food, if you will. Um, but we lived within feet of each other for for a month. If, if you if you can survive that, I guess similar to being a torpedo a, a submarine operator, if you will, if you can survive that as a team, you build a really good team. I think that's what you, there, there's so many points that you just put in there that like there's only so many I can I can remember to be able to go back to. But one was, you know, Jeff Lapser said a good idea at the wrong time is a bad idea. Right. Um, and then to your point there, as far as, you know, like the, the team atmosphere and being out at the rig, I always told guys that worked for me, I said, you know, being MWD hand is, is one thing, but getting along with three other grown men that you're having to live with inside of a, you know, a trailer um for you know weeks almost months at a time um not having any sort of background uh knowledge on each other just knowing that you're all out there to work together as a team to be able to do a job i mean i think anybody could attest to the fact that they've had a friend or they've been in a situation where it was like you know them and their best friend became roommates and then all of a sudden ended up hating each other even though they were best friends prior so to be able to take that example and then put it out in the oil field, it's like, okay, now you don't even know these people. You're not friends. And now you do have to live together. It's like, it's bound to cause, you know, a mountain of issues, right? So to be able to have that as, as like a software team out at the rig, which brings you to another point, it's amazing to be able to hear that, that that's what you guys did as opposed to just having one person go out to the field and then try to re-communicate that back to a group of, uh software guys that are programming at a different location to actually get them out on the rig and see and interact with it and be immersed is i mean it's, it's a very high level of leadership there and then that goes another point that i was gonna say is like having the leadership to be able to take back and step back from what you may have a skill set in and to jump back off of that and allow somebody else who is you know qualified and it doesn't even have to be that they're smarter than you but just to be able to delegate that work and say hey look we're gonna let you have ownership of the product like so many amazing points of what you just said there. And thank you. <laughs> I don't really have a well, question. Yeah, so, so I, I didn't give you a secret sauce of how to make a startup company, but it's 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 I've 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 learned a lot along the way and have a lot of scars to show for it, but but perhaps more more important than anything else is you have to be able to get along with people and you, and you gotta be really good about hiring the right people. Um and you know one of the things that Kind of going a little bit off. One of the things that an early manager of mine at Motorola back in my early days told me is he you know, said, whenever you hire people for your team, I won't say it the way he said it, but hire hire people smarter than you. And um, and it, it, it's kind of took me back. Well, that's kind of. I said, well, wouldn't you always just hire the best person? He said, well, yeah, you, you always try to hire the best best person. That's what everybody says they're doing, but oftentimes managers will try to hire somebody that is non threatening to them as in somebody that couldn't take their job in the future. And that that made all the sense in the world. They said, you know, the, 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 the fallacy of that is that A, you wind up having people that can't do the job as effectively as, as somebody that's perhaps better. B, it doesn't give you the freedom to move on and do other things in your career path because you don't have somebody to replace you. At least if you do, there's a void there that causes problems. Uh, and that stuck with me early on. So I, I've always made it an intention as I was as I was building teams and when I try to hire people that were smarter than me and people that I thought that could do my job and take my job from me someday that would give me the freedom to go off and do something else. Um, and so that, that's 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 a philosophical sort of statement, but it's, it's it's separate from startups and whatnot. But in a startup, it's incredibly important to hire people smarter than you. Um, or to partner. With or part, like either, yeah, either, yeah, either one, but it's 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 uh, but it's uh, it's human nature to to bring people into a mix that are are, are non threatening. I mean, non threatening from a sec of uh, intelligence level, whatever we call it. Um, but they also want to hire really good people because if you're gonna if you're gonna be committed to something like you have to be at any startup company, you have to really enjoy who you're working with. Um, there's nothing worse than you just it just 
companies won't survive if there's if there's too much tension and if there's always going to be some tension um but the best way to mitigate that is to find the people that are that are uh, the best people ahead of time, both both in intelligence and also in in, in teamwork. There you go. Well, I, I know there are a lot of people that are watching, and I think because of some of the disruptions that we've had with the show, there are people that are asking some questions or they've got comments that are coming in at like it's not quite consistent to where we're at. So if anybody that did ask questions that I didn't throw them up there, it's not because I was avoiding them. It's just that maybe you ask questions and you're like actually. 20 to 30 minutes behind on the conversation of where we're actually at in real time. So it's not, it doesn't fit the flow of asking questions, but we did get one here from uh, Duncan. Uh, Gross it says, what are your thoughts on new technology and scope creep for the product? As in, it seems cool e and easy to add new features. I'm guessing there was a lot of that um, throughout the time. Yeah. That it, we're heading so, up so, projects. so, I will say probably one of my weaknesses is that I always want to do more um, as far as uh, feature sets and new new functions and whatnot. And if you, um, what, I, what I think Doug is referring to is, you, I mean, just in general, I mean, you can you can have feature creep where things get so complicated that it, it doesn't function properly or or it gets convoluted. And, and there are absolutely are, are features that were added and then essentially commented out over the years on the on. I'm talking a lot about motive as a as an example case, but but there were features that were added and removed and added and removed in, in different different ways. And so um, not every feature brings commercial value or or helps with um, engagement and, and change management. Um, but I will also say that that you know creeping elegance is a very a very difficult thing to avoid. However, when you're trying to do something that's truly disruptive and new. You have to experiment. You have to try to push push the edge a bit because you don't necessarily know which things are going to be uh, the things that are going to are going to are dig in and, and, and make success. I, and I, I think and I'll try to give a good example in hindsight of a feature that we thought was going to be really great and it turned out to be not not impactful or vice versa. But uh, um, you know, one one of the things that 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 I'm convinced is going to be a huge thing in the future, um, and I've used it personally, is 3D visualization tools. Um, and yet the, the majority of the people on the rig sites um, are not thinking in 3D or don't want to see things in 3D, uh, whether it be a geologist or the drilling engineer or drilling, dr uh, driller or coming in or whatnot. And we sourced people from the gaming industry to try to make the most intuitive 3D visualization we could. And we did so because you just can't substitute the amount of information you can gather from three-dimensional space um, and I, I did it because back when I was at the small directional company, I get a phone call at 3 a.m. trying to figure out what was going on. And you spent half of your time as you're waking up looking at Excel spreadsheets and looking at emails, looking at data files, listening to what the person on the other side of the phone is, is telling you happened, who's also trying to CYA as they're doing it. Whereas um, the 3D graphic we built, I could look at it and then like, in like 10 seconds, I knew what was going on with the well. I could sort of see how it happened, where it came from. You know, I could, I could tell if the slide quality was bad or good by, by the, how the visual spikes and stuff like that. I've, I've over the years found the 3D visualization tools to be incredibly valuable, but they have not been consumed by the users nearly as much as I thought they would be, frankly. And, and I never, frankly, I, I still, I still don't think it's something that, that anyone should give up on because I think that's eventually going to flip over. Uh, but we've got, the ability in that tool to show visualization of, of uh, formation tops and ge uh, geological formation stuff, uh, ROP, MSC, unbelievable stuff you can show in 3D. And uh, uh, I, I made a joke with one of the lead 3D developers that was getting frustrated by people not using it as much as others others would do well. I said, well, we'll go to the people that say they don't they don't think the 3D helps them and give them an eye patch. Um, <laughs> Because if, 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 if three-dimensional space is not important to do your job, then you should be able to put an eye patch on, just use one eye, and you, you're just fine. But uh, I don't know if they actually ever hinted at eye patches. But, but uh, it, to me, it was, it's, it, there's just so much extra information there that, that hasn't gotten it. So, so tying us back to the comment about creeping elegance, um, you, can get, you can add features and functions that are unused or add complexity and reduce reliability of products. It's a, inherently a, a, 
a uh, inventor's dilemma, for lack of a better way of saying it, to, to not add too many things that are, that are not useful. But there are some things that you have to maintain commitment to that you know will eventually become a critical element and not give up and let those things go too pre prematurely. Um, so so I, I don't know if I answered the question. I kind of rambled again as I, as I have on this call this entire time. But <laughs> but I, I think as, as a new disruptive thing, you have to try new features. You have to have some commitment to the ones you're most committed to or most believe in the ones that are going to ultimately have impact and figure out how to fold them in a way that the, the consumer will actually consume them. I got one other comment here uh, from James. He says, innovation is not the problem. Acceptance of new technology is the problem. So yeah, that's back to change management. Um, you know, the, the, the thing I, I've, I've actually become more and more focused on change, but I know that, that, that uh, H and P has been focused on that for the last several years because it's, it's, adaptation of things that are that are major improvements can be slowed by that. Um, I've also spent a lot of personal time, particularly as I've started getting into other industries with my work at Hunt now, looking at other industries and how they've done change management, not just like the historical Uber and machine shop tools and whatnot, but even going back just like a, as a personal interest in, in looking at this. And, and one of the things that I, I think I shared with you the other day, David, but the, um, this is a, a light bulb from the, let's see, I'll turn it off to, it's a special light bulb from, from the 30s, but it, the, the person inside the light bulb is what's called Ready Kilowatt. And Ready Kilowatt is kind of like the Mickey Mouse cartoon for the electrical industry. And back when, when electricity was, was well, when the US was electrified, I mean, you, you, you see this stuff, okay, New York City got light bulbs and whatnot. But as it went across the country, there were a lot of rural communities that weren't sure they wanted to have wires running and you know, supposed to get electrocuted, what happens if this happens? And, and there was a lot of fear of electricity. And so the, the electrical industry came up with Ready Kilowatt in part as a promotional product to, to people to, to, to use electricity as a, as a method of improving life, in part of a way to demonstrate to children the safeties and stuff around, you know, don't plug, don't put metal things into the outlets and whatnot. But there was a multi-decade uh, uh, effort across all the electrical sub um, uh, utilities and, and communities and whatnot to promote safety and adoption of electricity using a cartoon character. And while I don't think that will work in the oil field, you know, a little drill bit that runs around and that's probably not going to help with automation adoption. Um, I found it fascinating to find uh, as many uh, examples of success stories in other industries that have caused people to adapt faster. Uh, if you look at, if you look at autonomous cars, um, Think about how long ago, I mean, I've got ads from the 50s that showed pictures of people playing cards in, the, in, a, in a convertible car driving on the road from the 50s. They thought it was on the verge of having a, you know, automated cars driving. And we're still not there. I mean, there's the Tesla autopilot's pretty close, but we're still a long ways from, from wide, wide adoption. So um, the common innovation is not the problem. There's, there are plenty of innovators. I'd say besides the, the change management piece of it, um, I think there's also a, a gap in getting ideas from ideas to products is a very heavy lift. And I think there's a lot of ideas that people just give up on or they, or they don't have the resource or access to the resources. So I, I, I think that in addition to the adoption side, I think there's also a um, incubation of, of ideas in the industry that's lacking. She says it was the 1950s Mercury Ragtop. Yep. It did have, uh, it did say this also as well, a uh, very comprehensive presentation. The backing of Ray Hunt family uh, obviously gives a stable foundation for Todd's efforts. Um, yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, if, if it wasn't, if, honestly, if it wasn't for being in the, the Hunt organization early on, there's no way that, 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 that motive would exist today um there's some other product lines that, are, that i'm involved with now that there's no way without having that kind of backing would, would be moving forward um so so having some people uh in an industry that are you know i, I would say that that ray and his, his entire family have always been contrarian innovators meaning contrarian mean that they, they tend to when everyone's going one direction they say well what's the opportunity the other direction and so just by their DNA, they are they are very aligned to out of the box thinking and 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 have been very supportive of, of some crazy ideas I've been involved with. So it's been 
been a great thing to have that support. Jerry also says uh, very effective rambling communication. <laughs> and then Duncan says rambling uh, was good. I was interested in your thoughts and, and insights. Well, uh, yeah. Well, I, I, again, I, I enjoy talking about this stuff. Obviously, I have a passion for it. I've been through a lot. Um, and it, it's, um, Frank, I'm, I'm in a position now having, having a great time doing what I'm doing. Um, but <laughs> they're, they're, you'll, you'll definitely get challenged at times throughout, throughout the, uh, the path. All right. So I got one last question for you. We'll throw this one up from James and then uh, we'll let you go or let, whatever you, you want to ramble on about. Uh, Cause I, I know I, I don't have you all day. So uh, besides surface optimization, how does, how, uh, how do you feel about the use of downhole drilling optimization tools? It's kind of very open-ended there as far yeah, as so, so there's, there's drilling a, optimization is, but your thoughts. Yeah, so there's a lot of directions that could go with that one. I mean, I, uh, the, uh, Obviously, there are really advanced rotary steerable tools, and some of those are, are very impressive functionality-wise and whatnot. Um, uh, I've always focused on trying to make the, the least expensive downhole tool function as optimal as possible, so that typically lean towards mud motors. Um, but there are areas where rotary steerables make all the sense in the world, and, and it's an impressive machine. Uh, the, the surface optimization can be done through software and other technology. Downhole optimization um, I'm trying to sort of read between the lines of what that would be. I mean, there, there are people that have looked at doing sampling of rock downhole to do like literally like a, 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 a core log slash, you know, you can, get, you can get triple combo stuff going down to do evaluation real time. And there are people that have looked at using those inputs to actually control the rotary steerable tools. So if a self-contained control system where the surface gear is kind of just only getting the information that, and it's just sort of, following its own path as it determines. Um, I haven't seen it actually done. I just know there's there's been some people that looked into this over the years, and I find it to be incredibly challenging to put that much complexity into a downhole tool that can survive temperature vibration and whatnot. So um, uh, I, I think there are other forms of optimization where you're talking about uh, 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 shock subs and dampeners and things like that all those things have a place you, you have uh, uh different kinds of bit optimization um that obviously the right bit for the right job the right rock all makes sense um so about, as i'm not sure it's a downhole optimization versus surf, surface optimization i think that just putting the right tool in the hole um, is critical which is part of the reason why the drill scan acquisition was so important because they could model stuff before we get into the hole um and we could evaluate the performance of the data as we had an, a, an actual run to figure out, you know, what did it actually do and then improve our suggestion of what to do going forward. Um, so that's another form of downhole optimization and it's sort of the planning and the replanning um, of what you're doing. It's, it's if we could have a, an iterative approach where we're constantly improving the process, literally every bit run with slight pieces of new information, that's, that's where computer processing could become hugely um, uh, amplified, if you will. I at the moment, I'm I'm I would lean less optimistic about a completely self-contained, some kind of downhole AI self-evaluating rotary steerable tool that like finds the seam and, and follows it. I, I I think that's very attractive, but I don't I don't see that being practical in the near term. And particularly as we start trying to do things at higher and higher temperatures to address the geothermal market, I think that becomes even more challenging. So so. Sorry if I misinterpreted the question. Um, I think it was Duncan, but well, he was saying uh, what I meant was using surface data versus downhole electronic data, for instance. Oh. Data clips. So I, okay. I and I'll add on to that because this was going to be my final question. It's my opinion that I think high speed bi directional communication with the BHA is like the key to really be able to unlock the future. What are your thoughts on that? So, so, so now that I understand the question better, so, so, it's crazy to me that we are, uh, to your point, we are literally dealing with smoke signals. And <laughs> and I, I I used to have a, a, a series of slides and in, in, in documents where I had you know a, a individual puffing up and it was, I wasn't sure if it was politically correct to have an, an Indian doing smoke signals or something, but but it literally when we talk about mud pulse telemetry. It is smoke signal speed. I mean, it's, it's single-digit baud rate is what we're dealing with here. 
And EM is better, but it's still not great. And there are pulsers out there that can do incredibly high data rates under the right conditions, the right scenario, the right depth. And what, but it's not necessarily a you know off the shelf commodity that you can put out to any any well in in Midland Basin. Um, and I I believe strongly enough that there was actually a project that that was initiated to hunt and and it's on the uh, it's H and P owns the rights to it now that that's a different kind of a uh, telemetry device. Um, that may never see the light of day at the end of the day because it's, it's a very challenging thing to to launch commercially in, in a market like this. Um, but I believe strongly that more data is better. Um, uh, and the um, I've seen multiple attempts at wired pipe. Um, it's very expensive, hard to get there. So I, I don't know what's going to be the ultimate solution to that. But if, if fast forward 10 years, we're still dealing with, with smoke signals, I'd be really surprised. Um, the fact of the matter is we're drilling at speeds now. Um, I mean, I, there are places where you're drilling two miles in a day. That is insane. If, if you think about just the time it takes to take surveys and, you know, to pump the survey up and then you're already at the next stand, it, it's, it's amazing. And so I don't even, frankly, I don't even know how you geosteer a well at, at, at that ROP because you're, 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 you're you know, I used to joke about being a, that ladder truck that had the guy in the back with the steering wheel in the back that was trying to, to, to drive the, the back of the, of the ladders. This is the longest ladder truck you've ever seen when you're going that fast. <laughs> so it's quite dangerous. Um, I also believe somebody's, somebody's going to crack that, whether it's whether it's a, a acoustic or new kinds of EM or, or wired pipe or something. Somebody's going to crack that. And then we're going to be dealing with not just 2x the data, we may be dealing with 10,000 times the amount of data on surface that's available to us. And as fast as drilling, as fast as trying to make decisions today with human directional drillers, multiply that by 10,000, no way. So, so the only way to truly leverage that data that would, if, if it was available to us at higher sample rates, higher accuracy, higher, higher fidelity, is to have some kind of computer system at the very least make it digestible by humans. But in, in reality, it's, 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 how do you process that data in real time to make it useful to make decisions? How do you aggregate that in multiple areas in a, in a region? Um, it just amplifies the reason for, for, for automation. So I'm, 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 I'm passionate about solving the, the, the smoke signal problem. Um, but I would, I would say it's, we haven't made a lot of progress in that space in, in the last few decades, which is disappointing. Well, I always love being able to end the show talking about MWD. So, I mean, obviously a, a passion of mine, but then we did get Jason Norman just said, he, he says question for Todd, but he didn't write a question. So Jason, you might have to uh, give it another couple seconds if you just slow typing, but maybe it's up there. All right. Anyways, well, Todd, thank you so much for coming on the show today, man. I really, really, really do appreciate it. And for anybody that is still watching, this has been a goal of mine since the very beginning of the show um i don't know where the list is but i wrote down a list of like the top five names of people that i wanted to be able to have on my show and you were probably number two or three i think fred dupreis was one um terry frith i think was was two he was a you know it's still ceo president or whatever uh, uh at gordon technologies and you were you had to have been number two or three on there. Well, so well, just just so people don't think I totally ghosted David, I actually had a scheduled interview. We did. And, we did. I, was, I came back on a cruise ship into New York in March of 2020, <laughs> and it was supposed to be in person, you know, South Austin, where your where your, where your uh, studio was, and pretty much everything fell apart from a COVID perspective in that same week or so. So that that didn't happen, and then it just. You know, for a myriad of reasons, it hasn't happened since then. Um, and one, one of these days, I'd, I'd love to, to to get on and talk more about uh, some of the stuff I'm working on that's more energy transition stuff at, at Hunt now that's not so much drilling focused, but it's really energy set focused. I mean, everything from, uh, I was joking with David earlier, and I've, I've got a Mr. Fusion in my office because we're looking at technologies to convert trash into syngas to, to power electric vehicles. I mean, th things that are really kind of wacky out there, things that we can add to our existing portfolio of, of organizations in the company, but I, I still very much enjoy uh, being a, a member of the, the h &P research development team and working with uh, Stefan and Angus and, and Teddy and the, the whole group of people there that are that are all uh, innovators in the drilling space. So I still think I have, I have my finger in the pulse and involved in some future technology stuff there. 
but I'd love to be able to someday share some of the crazier out of drilling stuff I've been working on. Well, there is always an open invite for you to be able to come back on the show. Todd, thank you so much. I really, really, really do appreciate it. I know we got a ton more questions in here and we just didn't get a chance to be able to get to. Thanks for all everybody out there that's been watching um, and supporting the show. Uh, it's times like this is just reminds me how much I love doing this show. Uh, and hopefully everybody else out there, you know, got something from it. Uh, so please like, share, subscribe. If you're walking on YouTube for the first time, hit the subscribe button. Um, if you haven't shared the show before, please share it with somebody else that's a professional in the industry, especially today's show. If you know somebody who is a uh, an entrepreneur trying to grow their business or whatnot, uh, I think today there's so many lessons learned from it. Uh, please, please put it out there. Let them know. Tell them to you know binge it this weekend instead of watching some uh, other Netflix documentary or whatever. So with that, Don, once again, thank you so much. And for everybody out there, as always, know your industry.